Welcome back to Making Records with Eric Valentine. That's me. Uh, I'm actually traveling at the moment. I'm in California in my old uh, Topanga spot. You can see uh, this is that room. You can see the uh, diffusers, you know, <laughs> hanging out there. It's being used more as a yoga studio these days. But, um, uh, but yeah, I'm here. We're doing another episode. This one is going to be more wiring stuff before we dive into that. Um, one quick thing. There was a, a, inter interesting on the last episode. Um, uh, I didn't, I don't know, I didn't record a, a response to this specific um, comment on the last one. I thought I'd just tack it on to the front of this one. But um, so the last one was this whole GB tracker thing. And um, Early on, someone suggested this. I answered it uh, just typing in a response um, early on. And then, uh, you know, I certainly understand that not everybody that comments reads all of the comments in there. It's totally understandable. But then a whole bunch of other people, there's probably half a dozen people, had the same suggestion. And uh, it's a very, very clever suggestion. There is one sort of technical hiccup that makes it so, unfortunately, in this case, it doesn't really... Um, uh, work to solve the the issue that I was chasing, uh, so I just wanted to comment on that really quick. So, so this was the suggestion of using a looper pedal um, because you know the difference in the performances makes it very hard to focus on what the differences in the sound, just the sound, might be because the differences in the performances can be much more much more overt um, than very subtle dis differences in you know, whatever, the impedance of an input or something. And, um, and so people were suggesting using a looper pedal so you would have the identical performance going to um, both direct to the amp and um, going through the GB tracker. The unfortunate thing about that is that really what I'm trying to, um, to replicate with the GB tracker is the sound of the guitar being plugged directly into the amp. And so that is a passive interaction between, you know, the source impedance of the guitar and the input impedance of the amp. And as soon as you put a pedal in between there, that's an active pedal, uh, has an amplifier, a gain stage in it, which a looper pedal would certainly have, um, then what's happening is your uh, defining the sound by the input impedance of that pedal. And so the pedal is capturing the passive interaction between the output of the guitar, the input impedance of the pedal, and then it would be passing that on either directly to the amp or through the GB tracker. And so unfortunately, <laughs> it wouldn't, wouldn't totally answer the question for me. I think they would both end up sounding pretty much the same because the, the output of the looper pedal would not interact with the those different impedances in the same way that the output of the guitar would. So, um, again, super clever idea, but uh, just because of the fussy nature of what was being chased, it, it wouldn't quite work in uh, in this particular circumstance. But as always, I appreciate all of the very thoughtful comments and suggestions and stuff. I just wanted to answer that one. Um, so. Let's dive into this next round of wiring. Um, uh, so when we pick up here, this is July 31st, I believe, uh, 2021, still wiring away. And at this point, I brought in uh, an old wiring friend uh, of mine from California, this guy, Ken Miller. Um, he worked for Undertone Audio for a period of time and just does beautiful wiring work, incredible. He just has that really, meticulous patient, you know, nature where he can just go and really take the time to, to get it right. I, I, I don't have that. <laughs> I, I, as soon as it's to a point where I think, okay, this will sound good, then I'm, re I'm ready to move on with my life. But uh, so that's why I have him do this stuff. Um, so you get to see uh, Ken wrangling a bunch of this Cat6 stuff and trying to make it look like a, a work of art. And he is darn good at it. So here you go. Check it out. Okay, so we've been wiring away here for a while in the studio. Here, here we are, we're doing stuff. And uh, I brought my good buddy Ken Miller out here. He used to work for uh, Undertone back in the day and uh, is sort of our, our wiring guru. Or, or really, anything that needs to look amazing, then we just call Ken. That's, that's how that works. And so 
So this is this is what we're doing. There's Ken. So this, uh, I think I have another picture, so you'll have been able to see what this looked like before. Um, but this is what it's turning into now. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just like this giant mess of Cat6 cable coming out of the ceiling and used to go down this, this trough here and get landed um, to all of these places. There's the network switch and there's a bunch of headphone stuff or an Avion system. And then I'm doing this thing where you can use, you know, Cat6 cable for, um, for microphone lines. So there's a bunch of that too. So, um, so Ken, what are you, what are you doing over here? Uh, finishing up the extenders, the wiring for the extenders. We have HDMI extenders that go from our HDMI router in the rack. Right. And uh, we have our transmitters here that go to the various monitors throughout the room, uh, throughout the studio. We have the lounge and the big room, things like that, that we want to actually control what people see. Right. And uh, those will all be routed through the router. Yeah, there's a big, uh, it's a little hard to see. I think uh, maybe you can see that, but there's a 16 by 16 um, HDMI, you know, matrix switcher thing. So. You can have as many 16 inputs, 16 outputs, and any of the inputs can go to any of the outputs, or all one can go to all the outputs, whatever. You know, it's it's like the thing that you'd use in a sports bar kind of a thing. You know? And HDMI doesn't travel well over long distances, and so they have different means of extending that signal. This uses uh, regular Cat6 cable. To yeah. Extend. You can go up to I think 150 feet or something like that with these. Yeah. And uh, and then these are the receivers for the cameras. These are SDI uh, cameras that we have in the big room, and then we have more HDMI stuff that's coming in from other cameras. Yeah, other locations. We're gonna have some like roaming, you know, rolling camera monitor things, so you can just like wherever somebody's in a, a room, I can just plop this monitor and a camera. You know, it's kind of like these these new like uh, remote doctors you'll, in a hospital. You'll have this thing that rolls around, has a monitor and a camera and a microphone, so the doctor can just stay in one place and go to all the different rooms, you know? So it's kind of like that. And uh, so that's it, you know, Ken has tamed the Cat6 Beast. We, we've run somewhere around 7,000 feet of Cat6 cable in this building. It's super crazy. <laughs> I, I had no idea. I, I vastly underestimated the amount of uh, Cat6 cable we would use. I, I under ordered, we ran out immediately, you know, like when we first started running it in there. And we actually, I did the runs with, uh, with Alex and, and Robbie, two other guys. And so we just kind of, you know, did all the drilling the holes and the studs and running the cable up into the, the rafters and stuff. And then, you know, Ken came to make it look like we knew what we're doing. So <clears throat> you can see the cable is just, here's, here's the big room here. And you can see up there, there's just cable running all the way across over there. You know, like some of these runs are, just over a hundred feet. So like the longest run is all the way over to here. Um, this is one of the isolation booths in the big room. And so here's Cat6 cable showing up here. We were trying to stick to a color code, but like I said, I ran out. So then the color code went out the window, but this was early, early in the process. So the, the color code still, still held here. And so what it was is uh, we did orange, for mic mic signal um, all the blue stuff is going to be some sort of network signal um, yellow is for headphones and oh actually wait a minute no I'm, I'm wrong about that the purple was initially the the microphone signal and then we ran out of it so this is probably still mic signal and what is this for what is this in it oh yeah this is a this is a jumper that so you can there's another panel down there and so you can feed the monitor signal from that panel down to this one. So, um, so that's what we're doing. We're just trying to like break the world's record of Cat6 cable in one building. And we, we may very well have done it. So let's see. I'm gonna check on that. So uh, there it is, um, the mighty Ken Miller and his beautiful wire, wiring skills. I'm realizing as I'm going through some of these clips, um, I, I'm definitely repeating myself a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're seeing it at various stages of completion, but um, I end up 
uh, repeating some of the um, general concepts about the wiring stuff. So you you know you hear me talking again about these uh, monitor stations that can roam around the room, all that kind of stuff. I know I'm, I've said it before, but you know some of these video clips were recorded months apart, and so I don't really remember exactly what all I did or didn't talk about. So I apologize about that. A uh, little bit of repetition in there. So in this next bit, um, uh, there's a whole there's one of the tie line panels that is in I think the booth the ISO booth in the small sound room and uh, and I'm sitting down to actually prep all the ends and land all that stuff in the panel just do do all of that um, that wiring so um, I took time to sit down and have a camera I did some time-lapse stuff um, so you can kind of check out at least m my approach you know mr. impatient wiring guy um, how I've been uh, the amount of effort I'm willing to put into it uh, to get it as re reliable as I need it. Um, so you can see my overall wire prep and soldering techniques. Here it is. Check it out. All right. So uh, more wiring stuff here. I'm, uh, I'm going to try and do this panel right here. Um, so, it, yeah, it looks like that. And so what I'm in right now is this is an isolation booth in the small sound room. So I already did all the prep work on those wires over there. That's the, the main part of the small room. Right on the other side of that wall is the control room. Uh, but this is just an isolation booth. There'll be a sliding glass door here. And, um, you know, just be a space you can throw an amp or a person or singer or whatever, you know, in here. And so we, we got to have some, some tie lines in here and all the stuff. So you can see on here. Da, 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 da. So there's eight actual audio tie lines. So that's going to be the Mogami cable. Um, I pulled a bunch of Mogami, cable, Mogami out of uh, Barefoot that I'm using here. There's going to be one line that sends signal into this space from the control room. So, you know, this is going to be a male connector. So uh, the genders will work right. And so this is mostly for like, if I'm doing my like guitar reamping thing, then... You know, I can have, I can be playing in the control room through a DI and have that signal come, get fed out into this booth and then go to an amp. If it's a combo amp, you know, I can put the, the whole amp in here and, uh, and feed to a reamp um, right here uh, through, through that connection. And then this is another one of these Cat6 mic tie lines. It gives me four channels of microphone signal over a Cat6 cable. Tape is not working anymore. And, um, and so if for some reason, you know, I put like a whole drum kit in here or something to have a million mics going on, um, I can uh, add another four channels of, of mic tie lines with that. This is for headphones, Avion system, uh, camera, so I can plug in a camera here and see somebody. Uh, network, so this is like if I do a lot of things where I'm tracking by myself, and so I'd have my laptop in here with me and doing you know, screen sharing remote control of the main computer. And so if I plug into the network with my laptop, then it just responds much faster, it works better. And then a speaker cable right there. Um, so that's if I have a head in the control room, but I wanna feed a speaker cabinet in this ISO booth, I can do that as well. So that speaker, you know, this speaker line will show up in a little panel in one of the uh, racks in, uh, in the control room. So here's all the wire coming out here. And this stuff is shorter than I would like for sure. This is the actual audio lines. Um, you can see it's being repurposed. It used to go into an Elko connector. It's got these Elko pins. So I'm gonna have to cut these off and prep these ends. And that'll involve you know, cutting off these Elko pins, um, stripping them tinning the the wire here and then that, that's it for this you know there's a bunch of work that's already been done there's already you know the outer jacket's already been trimmed off I can I, I get to save that labor um, there's a little bit of shrink wrap on here just to clean up that transition there and they even put um, some little Teflon tubing over the um, over the drain wire so um, so all I got to do is just um, strip and tin on those so it's a, a little easier here's the speaker wire this is some Big heavy gauge Mogami stuff, I think. Yeah, and so it's um, it's sort of faded here, but you can see there's a there's a mark on here for um, what side you can you know deem plus and which side is minus. And so I'll just all I have to do is just clean these up and tin them so they can go onto a quarter inch connector. 
Um, this is the additional uh, audio run. So this is some super low capacitance um, GEPCO wire. It's usually used for uh, digital signals and stuff. They call it X-band. Um, but it's great if you're doing a long run, you know, for this uh, reamp stuff, why not? I had it, you know, it was uh, just sort of left over um, at uh, barefoot. So uh, pretty much all the wire except for the Cat6 is recycled from uh, barefoot. Um, wire's gotten wildly expensive and it's just kind of dumb to just throw it away, you know. Um, it's, it, a lot of it can use, like this, this wire <laughs> was just like barely, uh, you know, a good length. So servicing this panel is going to be a little bit of a pain in my ass, but you know, hopefully I do it right and I won't have to open this up ever. Um, I can still get it open. I'll be able to get my hands in there, but you know, this is definitely shorter. I don't normally do it. I'll probably dress the other cables a little longer. Normally I'd have them like about, about this long. And so you can just tuck the excess back in the wall. And, uh, and when you want to work on it, the whole panel will come, come out and drop down like that. That's, that's really the way you want to do it. But, um, you know, trying to, trying to recycle, trying to save the planet here. So that's, that's the plan. So, um, so here we go. Here's the, uh, the cat six for the mic. Um, these three, one of these is network. One of them is headphone. One of them is, uh, for the camera. Um, and that's it. So I'm going to prep all this stuff. I'm going to try and do a, a time lapse. We'll see, uh, <laughs> see how I do. Fortunately with the time lapse, you don't, you don't hear me swearing all the time when I screw up. So, um, so here we go. Let's try it. <laughs> I've done pretty much all of this. This is all pretty much done now. And I just have one last Cat 6 to do. And I thought I would just kind of show this process because I, I just learned a bunch of really cool tricks for this from uh, from Ken. And uh, that's made this actually kind of doable. Um, you know, we had to do, I don't know, over 200 of these things, or we're in the process of doing at least 200 of these things. And so there's a couple of things that are making it um, not ma make me want to just kill myself. So um, this thing, for starters, this it looks it looks a little bit like a little shark. Dun, 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 um, is incredible. It it turned the most time consuming part of this process is untwisting these wires. You know the the twisted pairs in there, and this thing you know turns that into this really quick process. So. Once you have everything dressed to this point, so you know this, it, it has a little outer jacket cutting thing. So you you know cut the outer jacket, you pull that off, get the foil off, cut that off. There's a little plastic support in the middle, so you snip the little flanges of that, break that off, uh, and then separate these guys out. And then uh, what Ken showed me is you take each of these wires and you do a little twist, so it creates a little opening right at the base where they're coming out of the outer jacket like this, you do it with all of these, like that. Just for some reason on this particular cable is always the, has the tightest twist on it. Um, just kind of straighten it back out like that, make sure they're all, don't have any weird kinks in them. And then this, this thing, it's got this tiny little, um, little pin in there and you fit it between the two wires at the base and then you just go boop. And it untwists them and straightens them in one pull. It's totally incredible uh, how this thing works and makes this process go. I mean, it, it it's at least three or four times as fast. This is the most time-consuming part of this process by far. Okay, so now I have all eight wires untwisted and pretty darn straight. And so now we got to put them in order. I use the, I have to, I still have to reference the little, you know, pattern on my crimper tool. I don't have this memorized. I, I haven't done a lot of Cat6 cable. In fact, I, I think this is kind of the first time I've really 
um, committed some real time to doing Cat 6. So I'm, I'm sure by the end I'll have this memorized, but not quite yet. Okay, so we're going to get them in order here. And then white, brown, and then brown. So there we are. We're in order now. Uh, you know, they're kind of overlapping stuff at the bottom. It's, it's not that big of a problem because uh, once you put it in the connector, as long as you get it really straight at the end where, where you're going to insert it into the connector. So you got all this kind of squiggly stuff at the end here. Um, I do an initial cut just to get that off so I can get these to, to lay flat. I'm working them so they'll lay flat. I'm just kind of double checking the pattern here. It looks right. And then Ken showed me another cool trick um, to cut cut these at an angle that makes it easier to feed it through the connector and so something like that get a little angle on there and then we grab a connector these connectors have a little extra strain relief on them so I gotta get that out of the way and bend that back and then just try and hold them so they're all in the right pattern and just stick them through, bam, like that. That was that was a pretty that was a pretty good one right there. Got pretty lucky. Uh, and so then double check it for sure. So white orange, then orange, then white green, then saw blue, then white blue, and then green, then white brown, then brown. Yay, we did it. Okay, and so you put this guy all the way down, try and get that outer jacket sunk deep in there so you get a good crimp on that and then I'm gonna bend this little strain relief guy back a little bit and then take the little uh, drain wire for for the shield um, all of this cat six um, uh, for the purpose of of mic tie lines um, you have to have shielded uh, cat six cable um, if you don't have shielded Cat 6, then the Phantom Power doesn't work. So, uh, very, very important for that. Okay, so then we insert the whole steam and heat right into the uh, crimp tool here. to Get it all the way in there, seat it all the way, and then... Bah, chops off all the cables, gives you a nice clean end here. Sometimes there's a little bits of jacket left. I like to make sure that's off so it doesn't cover up the, the pins. Okay, and the last thing is just to uh, crimp the, the strain relief there. This thing has two, two levels to it, so. So here's the first one, kind of closes it up, and then this one really locks it in. There we go, nice tight uh, strain relief on there. Just that one. I want to make sure it's just get this little bit of jacket off here. Make sure it doesn't cause any problems. There you go. All right, so there it is. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> I hope that was interesting. Uh, um, just kind of looking back at it now, you know, I don't know, watching somebody wire stuff um, might not be the most uh, riveting experience in the world, viewing experience of all time, but um, uh, hopefully there's some useful information there. I've been wiring studios for a long time, and um, at least I've settled on a thing that seems to work for me. Uh, my stuff is generally, you know, pretty reliable and you know, like I said, I don't, I don't like to waste a massive amount of time on it. You, you can definitely do things that are um, probably look more professional, more refined, um, and could possibly make things a little bit more reliable in the long run. But um, uh, this has always been good enough for me. That's, uh, you know, if, um, if I feel like it's, it's going to last for the time that I'm in this building, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. So there you go. That is another installment of wiring stuff. Let me see what's going to be next here. Okay, so next round, um, we get back into some construction type stuff. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff of us doing 
the new exterior siding on the building. There's a little bit, a bit about the pond overflow drain in there. Uh, my my never-ending you know quest to try and conquer this pond. Um, so we will have that in the next episode. I will see you then. All right, bye. <laughs>